Action points are uh, beach restoration along the Jefferson waterfront and Jack Creek gravel. And I will explain why those two have been placed together. Uh, okay. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Thank you, board members, for joining us tonight. Uh, we have in the room, if you can see everybody, uh, Bob Reisner, uh, Eric Kuzowski. Yep. I got it. Uh, our IT support. Georgia, no. Thank you. And uh, Cindy Eklund, uh, Gary Cease, and Liz DeMoss, right? Uh, also on the phone, we have Tom Swan, um, Tyler Florence, the Park and Rec Director, and we have from the Army Corps of Engineers on the Japanese Creek Study, Lauren Oliver, the hydrologist, and Leif Cam, the project manager. Uh, so for tonight, it looks like a pretty busy um, topic or uh, discussions, uh, but all of these are somewhat interrelated. Um, so first I'm going to start with just a short term update on our mitigation projects out at Japanese Creek. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lee Hams for a brief um, um, discussion about the different alternatives from our Jap Japanese Creek project. And um, Lauren Oliver will discuss how sediment management planning in Japanese Creek uh, may play a part in a beach nourishment program for the city waterfront. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the city uh, staff planning for the beach nourishment test site. And then I'd like to spend our time discussing the beach revitalization uh, planning if we have time at the end, um, we'd like to ask if anybody has ideas on recreational opportunities for the Japanese Creek uh, feasibility study, and I will explain that. And then the last topic I can say right now, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Lowell Canyon Water Diversion System project team will be presenting at the Flood Board's work session on October 19th. They have just released the, uh, the feasibility um, report and environmental assessment and uh, have developed their preferred alternative and they will pre be pre presenting on that on the 19th at 6 o'clock via Zoom and we will send that out to um, all of our uh, city officials and, uh, and invite you all to attend. We will have one very big Zoom screen I hope. Uh, so start off with, um, I'm a little underprepared, I've been a little busy, we got uh, about 10 inches of rain since last Saturday. Uh, you guys know that a disaster was declared, um, the borough declared Friday and we had operations working out at uh, Old Mill subdivision, Cluster 1 subdivision, uh, Salmon Creek above the Clear Creek area, um, Sawmill Creek, uh, just a note for everybody as you're driving out Nash Road, take a look up at Mount Alice. And a couple years ago, we had a landslide come down onto the glacier that you can still see. Whole bunch of that material ended up moving down into Sawmill Creek this year. Oh, wow. And we got pretty close to uh, overtopping that bridge there at Nash Road on more than one occasion. Um, other work was up at Box Canyon in the Old Exit Glacier neighborhood, and then of course on the dump road, uh, we had water crossing, the low water crossing in front of the, uh, the gates, and uh, the diversion berm that has been built upstream uh, over top and had some seepage going through it, so we did end up with water in our main channel culverts. Uh, the main channel culverts is where there's the big catch basin dug out, and um, there's actually some really pretty blue water in there right now if you want to drive out the dump road. So, talking about our short-term mitigation projects. So the flood board has been working on planning and getting permits um, to haul away a bunch of the material from upstream. Uh, the upstream area is state DNR. So there's two different permits required. One's just a maintenance permit. The other is a material sales contract. Um, I'm really proud to announce, I know you guys have been hearing about it for probably two and a half, three years now, that the State Department of Natural Resources has issued the first uh, sediment management plan approval, and they have provided us with a material sales contract 
for Sawmill Creek. That now allows us to have a template so we can continue to work on sediment management approval on state DNR properties in our other watersheds. Uh, most of our creeks have state DNR land um, in, in some critical spots. So uh, this winter we'll be doing some sediment management planning for that state Department of Natural Resources um, sediment management approval and we've uh, received the material sales contract from them that's being routed through the borough now. So we are now able to remove material from Salmo Creek and to extract up to 5,000 cubic yards from Japanese Creek. Uh, downstream at Dick Raft Road, uh, once again, we're not working on a borough city property, it's the University of Alaska. Uh, we do have a draft permit that has gone through review at the borough legal and risk management departments and we have submitted to the university requested revisions to the permit. Um, once again, the university requires uh, us to pay for material that's extracted from their property. That downstream of Dick Rack Road is not set up as a material sales site, which means that we've had to kind of find a loophole uh, working with the university in order to extract material from the channel and that loophole has been to place material on Dick Graff Road. Um, some of the material that was placed just a couple days ago, uh, yesterday, was from upstream, um, and so you'll notice that uh, Dick Graff Road has a topping of some rather bumpy rock. I think it's better than what it was with all the potholes, but uh, you'll have to tell me as you drive down it. So that's where we're at with our short-term mitigation project. We basically are still waiting on one more permit uh, to complete work out there um, to haul material out. Uh, on our Army Corps of Engineers Japanese Creek Feasibility Study, uh, we've been working with the Army Corps since early spring. Um, the Flood Board, the City of Seward, and the Borough all put in a project match um, to come up with their 50% local sponsor match for a feasibility study under the Continuing Authorities Pro Program, Section 205, which is for flood risk management. Um, the Army Corps is putting in the other 50% match and their expertise to look at all the various alternatives to deal with flooding on Japanese Creek. Um, in June, uh, we had a charrette or a kickoff meeting with um, a bunch of our state our stakeholders and um, it was the first virtual shred with the coronavirus it was a two days it was a long days uh, but it was basically an opportunity for the community to discuss um, what are the different alternatives what are the challenges what are the barriers you know what's the pie in the sky if we could do everything we wanted to do um, so it was a, a long meeting I really thank everybody that spent time uh, participating in it you know, either part of those days or especially all of those days. Um, so we did come up with some alternatives, and I think, Leif, if you can hear me, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of go through um, what alternatives we're looking at uh, right now. We've got alternative one, two, three, and then I'll flip the page to the non-structural alternatives. Sure, this is Leif. I'll chime in here. Um, so we came up with three, three different structural alternatives, and they sort of vary in size and scale. And so the first one is a sort of an all-in plan. And the idea behind that one is to sort of scrap the existing levy structure that's there and just start from scratch, um, reuse the material where appropriate. Then we want to put in a debris space and they catch a lot of that sediment somewhere just upstream of Digraph Road. Um, and then develop the land situation to make that to make that work, whether it's buying out the land from the from the state DNR using the Burroughs Municipal Allotment Program or some sort of land swap, but however establishing that real estate so that it's not a continuous permitting issue. Amen. Um, Potentially increase command, increase command under Dick Graff Road, and then typically with core flood projects, one thing we like to do is add recreational components, and they can be scalable. So 
in that area just north of Big Rap Road. There's some discussion of putting a, either a dog trail or a boardwalk with an ethnic spot. Um, and so that's sort of the large, the, the, the number one alternative, and that's the big one. Um, and the, the next step down, sort of the middle of the road alternative is to fix the existing levee where possible. Um, we were up there about, a, oh, about two or three weeks ago now, and a lot of the tow has been undercut and is falling into the, into the bank. And so while the up portions of the levee look pretty okay, with a lot of that tow falling in and being undercut and the silver fabric exposed, the idea would be to rebuild, rebuild the tow where necessary, um, sort of in places rebuild the road or rebuild the levee, and then build the sediments, the sediment structure as before, um, same recreational as before, and so same thing as before, but rather than scrapping and starting over. Targeted, a targeted building approach. And then the, the sort of low end plan or the, the option three is to build the, just basically that targeted approach of rebuilding the levee where necessary. And we did spend two, one, one core. One of the core engineer's requirements, policy-wise, is that you look at a non-structural, at least one non-structural alternative, and that can be anything in the sort of relocating out of the flood zone, anything along those lines. And so we had we put forth two two non-structural alternatives: one is to relocate the landfill and basically remove the need for dig Road, um, and then the other is a lot of flood proofing down in the alluvial plant. Um, I will carry those forward through our cost benefit analysis and go from there. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Mr. So as the Army Corps team works through their feasibility study, their job is to look at all the different alternatives and eliminate the ones that aren't feasible or you know, don't meet economics or, you know, for example, relocating the landfill. Um, there would be so many challenges with that, you know, finding a new location. Uh, it would take probably 10 years just to close the landfill, the costs associated, you know, that's not a practical alternative for Japanese Creek risk management, right? So that's a pretty easy one for us to, to eliminate. So they'll be going through all these different alternatives and eliminating others, you know, flood proofing, uh, all the residential structures are doing a big buyout and relocation. As we all know, you know, the Japanese Creek alluvial fan, forest dangers, and uh, what's the subdivision of the, the fog map? The fog map. Um, those subdivisions, our new development. I mean, all of those structures are pretty recent, so buying them out and relocating those structures is not going to be a feasible alternative for flood risk management on a Japanese Creek alluvial fan. Uh, so the project team will be looking through all these different alternatives, and likely what we're going to end up looking at is, you know, a rebuild of the levee, um, recreational features, early warning system, and um, We've been really talking a lot about that sediment management piece. So we all know we've got huge volumes of sediment coming down from the tops of the mountains. They only get worse as our glaciers recede and as you know, landslides occur. Um, this last event was a perfect example of how sediment loads are going to be impacting um, all of our watersheds around uh, the Sewer Bear Creek area. So this is where sediment management planning is going to tie into a beach nourishment program. So um, we all know that the material that's just upstream of Dick Graff Road and the material that's downstream on the university property, uh, that's mostly finds a lot of the big boulders that dropped out earlier up in the watershed. We've got you know, some cobbles and gravel and, and fine materials. 
Um, it's pretty much the same type of material that's coming out of Lowell Outfall. Um, you know, it's just the opposite side of the mountain. And so what we've been discussing with our project team is, is there an opportunity to look at the beneficial uses of that sediment coming out of Japanese Creek or Lowell and a way to add that into our benefit cost analysis through the feasibility study. So looking at you know, using that material to nourish our beach or our waterfront that's no longer receiving that material uh, because of the diversion structure. And are we able to build in that beneficial use to add to our benefit cost ratio for this project? That's how the two tie together. So, took us a while to get there. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Oliver, who's the hydrologist, and let her talk a little bit about uh, sediment management and the uh, regional sediment management group with the Army Corps. Lauren? Hi, this is Lauren. Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Perfect. Okay, so as far as the uh, Japanese Creek CAP 205 study that Stephanie was just talking about, we can definitely look at a one-time uh, beneficial use of the material loop during construction. Uh, the uh, caveat to that is anytime you're trucking material and moving it to a separate location, which is what would have to happen uh, for the beneficial use on the beach, is that's going to be pretty spendy. So we're going to have to look at the cost of uh, moving the material from Japanese Creek uh, and see if it outweighs the benefits or if the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, so we'll definitely have our economic folks look at that. So that would be more of a one-time scenario with just the construction of uh, the set of management trap that we might put in or uh, some other construction activities. As far as a uh, more long-term look that would be with our regional sediment management RSM program and the proposals for that will be the request for proposals I should say will be going out sometime in the spring and so we can look at submitting um, Japanese Creek or other areas in Seward for beach nourishment and so what the proposal would be would be for a study. And so the study would involve uh, sediment modeling and we would help figure out where the best place to put the new material on the beach would be so that it would you know, stay longer and uh, not just get swept away. Um, so the caveat to this is the original intent of the regional sediment management program was navigation. So we'll have to try and spin this in a way that the uh, proposal would get chosen. So we'll have to talk with uh, some of the RSM folks to make sure that uh, the beach nourishment um, would, would qualify. Uh, another option altogether would be our environmental restoration ER CAP program. I'm not super familiar with this, but it basically is a program for modifications for improvements to the environment. Um, so I can try and find out more about this program. It might be another way that you can uh, try and get you know, some resources out of us. Uh, it's a pretty broad program, but again, I'm not too familiar with it. I just heard that it, it could be another option for you. And I think that's all I have. So uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, uh, so that's what we've been working on as far as sediment management with Japanese Creek feasibility study. Um, I think there's some good opportunity there for us to continue to pursue. Um, and just about springtime, I'm hoping that the uh, Army Corps project team will have narrowed in on their preferred alternatives and it would be a good time of year for us to uh, submit that request uh, 
or submit for a proposal to that request for quotes to the regional sediment management program. Um, I'm hoping that they might be able to provide us with some uh, studies of the waterfront. How would we spin it to uh, help navigation? I mean, that was the big push for why we should still be able to take sediment out of navigable streams, but why, how, how can we spin that in that? That's a good question, um, and it, I think it would be something that we'll continue to talk about with the core team. Um, I've talked with the project team up in the Alaska district, and I think we're going to try and set up a phone call with the regional sediment management group uh -huh. to see you know, if that's something that would fit in with that. Um, I think that regardless of whether or not we're able to get assistance from the Corps um, in that fashion, I think as a group, um, you know, as a community, we conti can continue to look at sediment management planning right. because we know we're going to be doing this for the next many, 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 many decades. So um, if we can find beneficial uses like change of putting our sediment management program into a beach nourishment program, then that's a win-win for the community. I think, uh, like Lauren said, it's really about what is the cost and is it worth it for our community to go ahead and do that. Um, at some point in time, we run out of places to run, to remove sediment from the creeks and place it. I mean, right, right. now we're placing huge amounts at the landfill so they can use it um, right. in the monofill. So I think, in my opinion, the beach nourishment it's always going to be bringing in storms and washing away. So, you know, in my opinion, that might be a good option. Yeah. Um, and so there'd be a lot of uh, planning that would need to go into it. I mean, obviously, last time we talked about uh, getting a coastal engineer involved and looking at how would it actually be placed, you know, uh, getting some new topographical or uh, bathymetry data um, so we could actually, I think our topo maps are from quite a few years ago. So. Um, those are in your packet. Um, and, you know, the Army Corps is able to provide some assistance, even just that study piece of it, of knowing, you know, from a coastal engineer's point of view, where we should be placing things. That gives us a great, you know, leap ahead to be able to apply for the required permits and know when we get to doing projects and we're removing material and placing it on the beach, then we've, we've been provided that technical assistance through uh, this type of program, so. Uh, we, we did meet, Tyler and I met with Stephanie um, along the park area to try and find some spots for the um, requested uh, experiment. Okay, the test, uh, test, test, test site. Test site, test site. okay. Um, so, and one of those was on, on the uh, last, on the contours over by the old pier that looked like one of the areas where it might actually stay longer than others. Where the crib is? What's uh, the crib? The where you haul boats out and set them on, a, on their uh, transom. It was in, the, it, it looked like a dock. Yes. Yes, yes. over by yeah. the... We took a walk along the waterfront and from our last conversation you guys had you know mentioned that you know Scheffler over there has kind of got a nice enough beach and then as you get closer and closer towards Jefferson it gets rockier and that's the picture that we're looking at in the front of the packet. Um, and so we were also looking at a section that we wouldn't be impacting the existing beach grass. Right. So one exactly. of the big concerns when we look at beach nourishment is we're going to have to really look at, you know, we've got the bike path there, we've got all of those fire pits along uh, the waterfront in the, you know, the beach grass, um, and, uh, and how do we you know, keep from destroying that as we look at our beach nourishment program. So um, that's outside of my expertise for sure. Um, so we have looked at the test site, um, the short-term mitigation project that we've been planning with the board, uh, if we're able to get permits and get that done, uh, what we talked about with the city staff was that we could take, you know, several in-dumps to that test site area. 
Um, if we place material below ordinary high water mark, we have to get an Army Corps of Engineer permit. We'll already have to get a floodplain permit. You can see here this would um, this section would be in the AE zone, so we're already going to need a floodplain permit. Um, but if you place any material beneath the ordinary high water mark, you have to get an Army Corps permit um, and probably fish and game and I would imagine state DNR would require a permit as well. Uh, so our test site, we were really looking at uh, placing material above ordinary high water mark. And the discussion back in the spring was, well, we've got these big storm events when we have our really high tides. Is any of that material going to wash down naturally? Um, and so that's why we were really looking at that test site here. So I'm going to pause there. I know that was a lot of information and see if there's any discussion from the board or from uh, commissioners, people on the phone. Could you go back one slide to that hydro, uh, the, the, the that one, and go to the waterfront and show me where high water, where the line is for the high Oops. water. Sorry, just pages are really blurry. So I see the cribbing is that rectangle right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And I see the outfall. Right. And so where's the line for high water? It is this dark That's it. Line. So if we put anything below that, yep. we have to get a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, and yep. you can see right here it says this is the 1993 meander. Uh-huh. Um, it'd be interesting to see if we had this uh, surveyed again um, if that was still the same. <laughs> so those two like triangle it looks like a nose on the northern side of the outfall the going nose. to the west. That spot right there, uh -huh. if we stayed above mean highway, yeah, right, right there to the west, yeah. we could put quite a bit in that little triangle mm -hmm. and, and as a, our, our test site. And that's that area where she was talking about beach grass. I mean, if you look at where they put the, the fire pits and everything, right. this is that one area that every time we get a high water, it sort of dips down and the path gets the water. Yeah. And then that opens up and there's two fire pits right there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that would be the, that that would be be the ideal site. place to put the test site. Yeah. That one or that smaller triangle to the south. Mm -hmm. but um, Right here. Right here. Yeah. We do want to be very aware of, of the outfall there because that, um, that's what runs from Lowell Canyon all the way down Jefferson Street and is used during maintenance. So yeah. we want to be very conscientious not to place any material that's going to impact the end of that outfall. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like um, talking with the staff and the Tyler, uh, and I'm forgetting her name, please remind me. Tracy. Tracy met with us um, so we could take a look uh, from Park and Rec perspective, uh, you know, if this would work for them. And of course, they'd probably need to get their equipment out there to smooth it out and spread it and uh, that type okay. of thing. So, um, uh, so that's where we're at with our test site. And we're basically waiting on permits to get to the point where, uh, where we get all the material. Would we want um, beach grass nourishment? beach grass nourishment on top of it then in the spring? Um, I mean, I don't know when you're planning on doing it. Right, right. I mean, would, yeah. would we want to put the grass on it as well to try to get some roots? Or are we thinking you put some root wads down first? Or We haven't gone that it? far, so that kind of input would be very useful, you know. Okay. One of the things that Tyler and I, at the very beginning of this project, when he first started, I, you know, we took him down, walked him through the property, and showed him the areas that we were thinking. Mm -hmm. And you know, even just getting the gravel there will be the first part of the project, and then and then working on seeing how it lasts over that storm surge time without grass, without the grass, just to see what that does, and then introduce adding in the grass areas to extend that out further. Hmm. Yeah, um, when I worked in the Keys and after the hurricanes and they wiped out the beaches, there was a, a, 
a volunteer effort to, I mean, the city bought the grasses, but then uh, there was a volunteer drive to plant it all. So I think it would be a good community project. I just had that very same conversation with the ladies at the fire creek or the uh, fire station doing the loading. Right. right. <laughs> so yes, I think uh, yeah. the I think we can find people easy. to help. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is Tom. I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. So one of the things we talked about, and I remember who we talked to. Um, I think it was the Army Corps of Engineers, and they're talking about uh, rather than taking this debris and putting it. Of course, it has to be above meander right now. But um, rather than trying to smooth it out, if we leave it piled up in piles, so storm surge has a tendency to walk, wash it down, as well as people walking over it and, and natural things that occur on a beach, that is all legally a way for this uh, material to get distributed down onto the beach. So I don't think we want to put sand on it until we get a well-developed, you know, sandy beach with something that's getting developed. But, but really piling the sand up or this debris up and then letting nature, rain and storm and people move it onto the beach. Hey, Tyler, are you on? Did you have any comment to that? Yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, I think we're open to whatever, you know, I think the most uh, effective course of action would be whether that means we need to, you know, proactively, manually, you know, spread materials out or, or just allow natural weathering processes and, and uh, the uh, public at large's uh, behavior sort of impact material. I think the only concern for, from our standpoint is if we leave the material unspread, um, you know, what are the chances or probabilities that there's a storm surge or something along those lines, will that material get flushed, uh, could potentially get flushed backwards uh, and then onto, you know, into the campgrounds, onto the record, onto the bike and uh, bike path there, uh, which could be, you know, could be quite the cleanup process or and I'm not sure how high of a pile we're talking about here, too. Obviously, you know, it reaches a certain height, you know, uh, if something shifts and there's kids playing on it, something along those lines, um, you know, maybe there's a minor safety concern there. So those, those would be sort of the um, thoughts that I think come to mind when we, when we talk about whatever course of action we want to take there. Hey, Tom, do you know of any communities that have done it the way you suggested, left piles of the uh, sediment instead of spreading them out? No, I don't. It was, just, it was something that was brought up you know, years ago in a way that because, it, you know, it, that method just doesn't need any permitting. And I, I remember, I think it was Tyler who talked about it, the, you know, a, a simpler permitting um, where we can put it, uh, in the upper reaches of the meander, and I, I don't remember that, but I, I just remember for our testing where we could just do something just mm -hmm. to see what happened. And I'm not talking about huge 20 foot tall piles, I mean, either or drop, dump truck loads uh, of, of stuff along that area. Just something super simple okay. that can be done, especially this time of year, and just you know, nothing. You know, I, you know, I don't foresee something that would be a you know risk problem because we're not talking that much material. So you're just looking to keep it simple and start soon. Okay. Correct. All right. We'll see where we can go with that. Any other comments or questions for the presentation so far? All right, Stephanie. What else do you have for us? Well, I, I know we our time is short. We got about what twelve minutes. So um, I was hoping we might discuss as a community kind of your vision of our final product. I know we kind of had this conversation a little bit, um, but I, you know, in my mind, I'm picturing you know the nice sandy beach that we have out on Fourth of July, and you can go take your dogs walking, and there's beautiful beach grass and. Um, 
you know, in my opinion, I'd really like to see fire pits moved off of the, the beach grass and moved, you know, closer into the campground. So I was hoping we could hear from people kind of in our final vision of what this looks like. Let's paint an artist's picture of what does our waterfront look like if we are able to figure out beach nourishment on an you know, annual or as needed basis. Um, we've got this you know, nice sandy beach out there. What do you see? Do you have any pictures of the outfall of, Res of uh, Lowell Creek, 1910, before, <laughs> before economic <laughs> development, so we could see what it naturally looked like there? I probably yes. do, it might take me a while to find Yeah, them, because yeah. eventually, I think, you know, sure tides and currents and everything change over time and the water level, but if we could, you know, find something similar to what was there, maybe it'll stay longer. Like before the railroad, before the fuel tanks, before docks and all that, what did it look like? I, I could make a comment on that. Go ahead, Tom. Well, for one thing, you would not, you would have a lot of logs and debris on there washed up because the river would cross trees down and that stuff would be up on the beach, would stay there. And that's something they've done in a lot of places where they're uh, you know, adding uh, debris along here with your sandy beaches, the whole sand in place. So, you know, I think the fact that I've actually thought of this, I don't know how you get campers not to, to uh, chop up all your uh, logs and stuff that wash up because that would definitely reduce the amount that, you know, wave action. But if you go back to 1910, you probably see a lot, a lot of debris on the beach. Natural debris, not plastic, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you go to 1910 and you have a lot of bunnies also, because uh, right. just for coming in here and throwing all the wood out. Right. But no, natural debris of flocks. Yeah. Branches. Okay. So Stephanie, just so you know, when Tyler first started, you know, one of the big projects that it, talking about beach revitalization, but also talking about um, with Tyler, you know, changing sort of that layout of where you have all the crew or all the campers right there, and then you've got, I mean, you've got this little green space that has, you know, there's the hill, and then there's a green space, and then there's place for the campers. One of the things that Tyler and I spoke about was, you know, getting rid of those fire pits, moving them off of the beach, and possibly eliminating those camper sites and getting green grass back in there and then putting designated areas for campers up above and then having an area that would be basically a green park space that would flow into our beach revitalization. You know, getting, getting that mindset of, no, I can't camp right here. I can't pull my camper here. This is gonna be just, you know, not tent camping, just an open area. More like on the south side of the pavilion? Yes, yes. And then and those, don't, those spots don't have electric. And so it would, you know, adding to the green space there like would help. No, yeah. So, can I just. The, the east of the tent, tent sites um, don't have electric. Removing right this portion to the, mm -hmm. the road and having this all become green park. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so having this all become Green Park and then, you know, having designated areas where there would be fire pits, but getting it off of this beach grass. And what I was telling Tyler when we moved here 15 years ago, there were no fire pits on the waterfront and you had beautiful beach grass that you had to sort of hike through to get down into the, you know, and that, I think that's a vision that a lot of people have expressed over the last, I'd say, six years on bringing that back and having that type of feeling. So, you know, artist-wise, when you think about it, think like Tom saying, beachfront with natural grasses and but the gravel and those things, but then up above it you would have a beautiful park. Does that um, count for your recreation on the low, <laughs> on the Japanese Creek sediment? Unfortunately, no, but oh. I'm gonna give like 
three more minutes to discuss how people see the water so Anybody on the uh, on the call interested in? Oh, we got. You. Yeah, I, this is Tyler. I just wanted to echo uh, Jackie's comments that you know we think we can do better with that space and that facility. Uh, I, I'd say we're we're not satisfied with this with the status quo either. And I think there's a lot of um, design enhancements that we can make that facility to improve the visitor experience and, and the experience for residents as well. So I think we're storing a little bit more of the natural greenery, uh, interlinking that green corridor and that trail corridor, providing a little bit more privacy and delineation between uh, areas of the parks uh, and the campgrounds, I think would be the benefit to all. So I just wanted to, yeah, just sort of, uh, uh, underscore that point, Jackie you make. And so to answer uh, Mark's question, I noticed, Mark Ganser, you asked, what's the hesitancy to getting a permit? It isn't that we're hesitant to get a permit, it's just that that takes time, and yes, we will work towards that, but just to get an in initial test site, we, we'd like to see something now when we have all this sediment that needs to go somewhere and just see what happens to it and then work towards the permit um, in the near future. Yeah, I think what I remember from our spring discussion was, um, I think it was like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 range. We'd gotten a quote from R&M Consulting uh, Engineering on you know, what would it cost to do some design and engineering on the coastal waterfront. Um, and they had said, well, we probably need, you know, bathymetry and surveys in addition to that. Um, and that was, you know, when I learned about this regional sediment management group with the Army Corps, you know, if we could get expertise on um, coastal engineers from the Army Corps to really look at this, then we'd be saving that, you know, that expensive. Um, we'd probably have to get some, you know, bathymetry or new, new surveys done. But, yeah. Right. So there's a cost. There's a cost to even just dumping some dump truck loads in the high, above the high water. The, everything yep. is a cost. Everything's a cost. Uh, just to give you an idea, so for us to remove material from Sama Creek, we just got our bids back. This is not hauling material. This is just the extraction of the material to stockpiles Creekside. Uh, our low bid was six dollars and sixty cents a cubic yard. You add on the haul fee to that, um, you know, from Japanese Creek to the waterfront and, um, and the placement, um, I would, you know, I'd probably guess double at least, and that gives us an estimate of how much it could cost us uh, to look at beach nourishment. And who's got that in their budget? <laughs> Tyler, you got that in your budget? <laughs> All right. Uh, so. Let me let me check in my other ledger. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so just real quickly, I'm going to uh, ask you to think about uh, Japanese Creek one more time. Uh, we do have the opportunity to give the Army Corps input on. Um, Oh, sorry, I had to include the photos. We've got our preliminary uh, flood modeling. This is the two-year flood event. What year is this one? This is like, what is that, 50% annual chance of flooding? Yeah. Um, right. You can see the impacts. Uh, so this is a model. This is yes. a flood model, yeah. And uh, then our 500-year event. Um, so just to give you some thinking. 1986, you mean? Yeah. yeah. This, yeah. One in 500 chance. That yeah, 1986. <laughs> uh, okay. So just to get you thinking about, there is the possibility of um, adding in a recreational feature to the Japanese Creek project once we get to design and engineering and we've selected our preferred alternative, most likely a rebuild of the levee and a sediment catch basin. You know, we'll see what else we end up coming up with. One of the things we've really been talking about is how do you add in a recreational benefit? They're already doing construction. They're going to be building parking area. They're going to be moving material. They're, you know, they've got to have staging areas. Um, so 
one of the ideas that I thought was brilliant that came out of our meeting with the Parks and Rec Department um, was that sediment trench basin area upstream of Dick Graff Road. If the borough or the city could find a way to obtain that land, um, maybe we could have like a dog walking park out there um, with trails or you know just a recreational area. We already know that that area gets used, but kind of make it a more formalized area. How about a man-made lake? A man-made lake. Just where all that deep blue is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's over my house. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's not where there's residences, and then, <laughs> then we have a water catch basin, and you know, it might go dry, but then the pretty blue water that's out there now it is going to get pretty. pretty blue, and yes. and we have to use dry suits to swim in it. But have moorage, have docks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You I mean, obviously, it, it need to be something that we would expect to receive flooding and yeah, oh, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, sediment management. But so. maybe some of the campsites that are lost along the waterfront <laughs> when the development is done could be retrieved in this area. Possibly. You know, the campsites we have now are in the tsunami earthquake zone, and we'll just put more campsites in the um, flooding zones, and, and mm -hmm. then. They, they're the first ones to be evacuated. Season, so. <laughs> uh, one of the other thoughts was um, up by the water tower at the top of the alluvial fan. Um, we've already got a cul-de-sac. Maybe we develop a, um, a trailhead that people can start hiking up Mount Mary Pond that direction. Um, I know several people that do it. I, I've never done it. But. You mean not bushwalking, but make a trail? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could work with State Department of Natural Resources to build a new trail at Mount Mary Pond. Well, the, the city owns some of that, and the Park Service owns some of that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a couple more. It'd be really great if we could uh, swap some land and not have to file for so many different permits from DNR, mm -hmm. University of Alaska Park Service. I mean, all these places that if we want to do one project, it's borough, city, UA, and DNR. You're preaching. You're preaching. No, I know. We got so, it. I, I'm just, <laughs> I, I, Sandy, with all due respect, you left out Siri. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Which is Siri. also in a lot of our areas. I know. I'm not sure it's right there where this one is, but yeah, that's another one. And it's just really hard when it's so, like, cut up. Yeah. Can't we swap some land somewhere? We're like, gonna look into the, it. The Nash Road bench. Let's swap some land. Okay, that's my two cents. Anybody else on the call? We have uh, just a few minutes until we have to reconfigure the room for our planning and zoning commission meeting. Um, I saw Tony on the line. Any comments from our council member? Anybody? No, thank you for all your hard work. Thanks, Tony. Anybody on the um, Bear Creek Fire Service Area Board want flood, flood. Flood. flood board? <laughs> flood board. Sorry, there's an F. It's a flood. It's a fire. It's something. Um, anybody? Hey, this is Eddie Castro. Uh, in regard to you know recreation opportunities on the Jap Creek. Uh, floodplain area, I, my preference would be uh, having those recreation opportunities on the lower end of Jeff Creek out of the neighborhood uh, to eliminate having traffic, eliminate kind of the uh, different activities that uh, maybe are not so great that happen at trailheads that are that are not, um, not monitored. Uh, so my preference would be to have those recreation components happen you know down by the dump and out of out of the neighborhoods and away from private property thanks ed i see stephen taylor with his hands up uh, steve taylor with his foot i also uh, think that while we were at the charrette that a lot of the talk about recreational area was because we were doing work down at the lower end that would make sense 
Anyone else? All right. Well, um, we'll see where we get to between now and our next quarterly meeting. Sounds good. Quarterly, right? Not semi-annual. Is it quarter? We will okay. meet as often as you want. Ah, yeah. thanks, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all your hard work. Yeah. You did excellent after 10 days of blood being. 12-hour <laughs> yeah. well, day. I yes. made sense. That's what you Yeah, That's you did. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. No, we're old school. Social distancing, we do all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the things that's often sick up.